All right, so we're on to the uh, second set of notes on momentum. Um, one of the ideas that um, we need to learn about with momentum is this idea of impulse. Um, impulse is the name given to any change in momentum. Now, um, we can actually derive um, a formula. There's two ways we can think about our change of momentum, and this actually comes from Newton's second law. So you recall that from Newton's second law, F net equals MA. But if you remember that an acceleration is really just a change in velocity over time, if we substitute this into our formula uh, for Newton's second law, we get F net is equal to M delta V over T. And then just by moving uh, delta uh, T to the other side, we can see that M delta V is equal to F net times time. And of course, M delta V, that is our change in momentum. So there's two ways that we can find a change in momentum, either mass times change in velocity or net force times time. Now, it shouldn't be too much of a surprise that net force has something to do with a changing momentum because anything with a net force on it is going to accelerate. And of course, if you're changing your velocity, you must also be changing your momentum. The key factor here is that um, it's not just the amount of force you apply, but also how much time is um, spent applying that net force. So to think about this, we've got a few um, situations here, a few examples um, where we can kind of relate this. Imagine a student jumping off their desk. Uh, when they land, they bend their knees, hopefully. <laughs> when they hit the floor, they bend their knees, and it kind of cushions the kind of cushions the landing. Um, why does this help prevent serious damage to their knees? Um, if we think of this, F net T is equal to M delta V. We can think of what which of these variables are going to be constant and which ones are going to change based on whether or not uh, they bend their knees. Well, assuming it's the same student bending their knees or not, the mass would just be a constant. And it's not immediately obvious, but whether or not you bend your knees, the change in velocity is also constant when you land. If you jump off a desk, you're going to fall a certain distance, you'll reach a certain speed, and then when you hit the floor, you're going to stop. So you can stop suddenly, or you can stop more gradually. And the key here is that if you bend your knees, you are going to increase the amount of time that you spend uh, stopping. And if you increase t and mass times velocity are both constant, then this must decrease as a result. All right, let's look at another example. So um, in sports, pretty much any sport where you're hitting something with something else, so baseball, tennis, golf, any of these other things, um, you'll always hear coaches say to follow through. Follow through in your swing, whether you're golfing or, or, or trying to hit a baseball or whatever it is. So if you follow through on your swing, what is going to change about um, your, your um, uh, hitting the ball? So you can imagine, again, you're hitting a ball. The mass of the ball is basically going to be constant no matter what you do. And you are only so strong. So whether you follow through or not, the force that you apply on the ball is also pretty much going to be constant. But if you follow through in your swing, the ball is going to be in contact with the golf club or the tennis racket or whatever it is for a longer amount of time. So we're going to increase the time that the ball is in contact. And so if you increase the time, and the force is constant, and the mass is constant, then as a result, the change in velocity must also increase. And so you could hit the ball faster, farther, that kind of thing. All right, um, let's talk about, uh, let's talk about, um, all right, let's talk about um, crumple zones. So in a car, cars are actually built in such a way that if you get into a collision, they're actually going to fold up in certain areas. Hopefully not in the area where you're sitting, but the front and rear of the car should give a little bit as opposed to being rigid. Um, previously, cars used to be built with really rigid frames, and they're built in such a way that they, shouldn't, that they wouldn't give um, under pressure. And so if you imagine that you're inside a car, whether or not there's a crumple zone in the car, the mass of the car is going to be a constant the um, change in velocity of you hitting something and coming to a stop is going to be constant. But again, if you have crumple zones, then you are going to increase the amount of time 
that um, you're going to come to a stop. Basically, that collision, instead of happening in a, a few milliseconds, might happen over a course of 10 milliseconds or something like that. And that can make a big difference because if we double or triple the time it's going to take to stop, then we can reduce the force by a factor of 2 or 3 since they're directly related. All right. Um, last but not least, uh, we're going to imagine a, a beanbag falling and hitting the floor and then a, um, a ball doing the same thing. So a ball hitting the floor and then bouncing back up. So which one is going to exert a greater average force on the floor? F net T is equal to M delta V. Now if we make the assumption that both collisions happen um, over the same amount of time, and that is a, bit, a pretty big assumption, but if we make that assumption where the change in t or the time that they're going to contact are going to be constant, and we know the masses of each are the same or constant in each case. Well, in actual fact, since the change in velocity of the beanbag um, is going to be smaller than the ball, because the ball falls down and bounces back up, whereas the beanbag just falls and comes to a stop, this is going to be greater for the ball. And if the change in velocity is greater, then so is the force. All right, let's look at a couple of uh, calculations. So in this example here, we've got a, a TI class super tanker. So these are some of the biggest uh, ships on the planet. Um, when it's fully loaded, it has a mass of 509,000 tons. So that's 509 million kilograms. And it's gonna cruise at about 31 kilometers an hour. Um, if the crew needs to stop as quickly as possible, they perform a crash stop, and they basically spin the engines backwards and try to generate as much reverse thrust as they can to stop it. And they can actually generate uh, 5.22 million newtons of stopping force. So the question is, how long is this ship going to take to stop um, at that, um, uh, given that force? We know that F net times time is equal to M times delta V. So solving for time, that's just um, m delta v divided by our, our net force. Now the mass of the um, the mass of the super tanker, as we said, we're going to put that in kilograms. So that's 5.09 times 10 to the 8 kilograms. And then the change in velocity. Well, we're going from uh, 31 kilometers an hour to zero. And 31 kilometers an hour, if we divide that by 3.6, we'll find that that's right around um, 8.61 meters per second. So 8.61 meters per second. And divided by the net force, 5.22 times 10 to the 6 newtons. This all comes out to be right around 840 seconds which just for perspective is right around 14 minutes which if you think about it is kind of a shocking amount of time when this thing's cruising at not really all that fast uh, that's how fast you drive in a in a school zone um, for it to come to a complete stop takes 14 full minutes and that's with the engines on full reverse and that's just because it's frankly it's so heavy even though it can generate a ton of force, it has so much forward momentum that it's going to have to apply that force over a really long period of time in order to bring it to a stop. Okay, the last example here I want to look at, and this is going to be a tricky one because this is going to involve something called vector subtraction. Um, a car is traveling east uh, at a velocity, let's say V initial, is 25 meters per second. And then they, they go around a corner, and after they turn the corner, they're now driving north. So their final velocity is going to be 15 meters per second. Well, it's looking for the impulse of the car while it turns the corner. And so notice here that we're, we're moving in two directions. We're going east and then we turn to the north. And so because of that, our velocity changes, not just because we go from 25 meters per second to 15, but also because the direction changes. And so if we want to find, let's say, the change in velocity, change in velocity is just going to be um, final velocity minus initial velocity. The problem is these are vectors and these vectors are in two different dimensions. You could think of VI as being in the X direction and V finals being in the initial direction. So what does it look like if we subtract V initial from V final? Well, another way of thinking about a subtraction is just um, adding a negative. 
So you could think of this as V final plus negative V initial. Those two statements are the same thing. So I can take V final and I'm going to add to V final negative V initial. And you have to ask yourself, what would negative V initial be? Well, if V initial is positive 25 in the x direction or 25 to the east, then negative V initial would just be the opposite of that, negative 25 in the x direction or 25 meters per second to the west. So if I add these two things together, V final which is 50 meters per second north. And then I'm going to add minus V initial, which is 25 meters per second to the west. When I add these up and find the total, this is going to represent my change in velocity. Since it's a right angle triangle, I can use Pythagoras to solve for the change in velocity. And that works out to be right around 29 um, 29.15 meters per second. Um, the, uh, the change in momentum, of course, is going to be m delta v. And so multiplying this by my mass of 1250 kilograms times 29.15 meters per second, I get a total momentum of right around 36 thousand kilogram meters per second. Now don't forget that this is a vector and so we need to do this in two dimensions which means we need to include a direction here given by that angle theta. And to find theta I can just use the tan and the um, opposite and adjacent side. So theta is just going to be inverse tan of 25 over 15. And so this gives me an angle of approximately 59 degrees. And if I want to be specific, that would be west of north. All right, and there's my total solution. All right, that's it for impulse.